No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. The question is, what can we Muslims learn about how to resolve this, these situations from our deen? And what is the cause of conflicts in the, in the world today, not just in the, amongst non-Muslims, but also amongst Muslims? And how can we resolve those with the application of Islam? But I'm not only going to talk about international and political situations, I'm also going to talk about the situations that Muslims find themselves in, in the West, where we are surrounded in, in, in an environment which is ideologically um, contrary to some of the values that we believe in. And I mean ideologically contrary is in that we are being taught and told in our schools and in colleges and universities, on media, um, certain values that we have to uphold um, as a prerequisite sometimes for seeking our rights. Or they, they tell Muslims that if you want to seek your civil rights as a Muslim, you have to come with these, uh, with the uh, particular wordings and values and ideas that we, we, we teach you. We have to use our currency to get to cash in for your rights. Uh, but unfortunately, in the process, Muslims end up selling out their deen in the process. So, so now going to the West, um, liberalism. What is liberalism? You hear it quite a lot, but what does it refer to? Liberalism isn't just simply you can do whatever you want because, well, clearly you can't do whatever you want in, in these countries. That, well, the fact that you're wearing masks means you can't do whatever what you want. Um, but the Canadian government will say that's, that's meant to be reasonable, um, reasonable protections. But there's a bit more than just uh, enforcing masks. In fact, almost every day in the UK Parliament, a new law is passed. Every single day, a new law, and each law is a new restriction. So how do you have a free country when there's everyday new restrictions are being passed by most legislatures, most governments? Right? Why do they call it free? Well, before I discuss that, we'll go to what the, defin the definitions or the, or the aqida of liberalism is. So I just gave you two quotations from John Locke. I'm not going to read them out to you. But simply, uh, John Locke argued that he believed that in a state of nature before government, all human beings were individuals, free individuals, was roaming around the wilderness, doing whatever they wanted as individuals, which is historically not true, because we know from all the archaeological evidence we can ever find um, and, uh, of, of early uh, kind of human migrating tribes and, and communities that at a very minimum, even in the Neolithic age, a kind of human group might be 30 individuals, not one, not individuals just roaming around by themselves. You need, you need a support network. People get sick, you need support. You need, you know, if, if you're not able to, to uh, you might hurt yourself, you need someone to look after you, uh, and then you can then reciprocate that. Humans form, um, kind of form um, uh, groups of people that can mutually help each other. It's natural, right? Tribe, basic tribal units is natural to be forming. But based on that assumption, they con he concluded that all human beings own themselves. All human beings are sovereign over themselves, which means that in an, if nature, in nature you're an individual, this means that uh, the universe intends you to be the, the god of yourself, basically, for want of a better way of looking at it. I call it the Tawheed of liberalism, where, where the only god is the one individual. <laughs> Every individual is its own god. Right? That's, I call it its Tawheed. And you might think, Abdullah, isn't that a bit extreme? Because no one ever told me that living in a liberal country, per se. Well, they don't say it like this. Uh, well, in some ways, they do. They say, you own yourself. Your body is your property. Right? It belongs to you. Your body belongs to you. Uh, your life, your choice. Right? Now, we're not saying that humans should be denied choice. But we're simply saying, pointing out that the doctrine that humans are absolute controllers of themselves is the belief that underpins all these things that you see in, um, in the West. Uh, next slide, please, brother. Now, I'm not going to give you loads of quotes. I'm going to give you nice, short bullet points, right, to make it nice and digestible. So, liberalism posits, posits that individual humans are the owners of themselves. This is called individualism. You might think, well, why is that so important? Uh, well, it's very important to, for Muslims because it has certain implications. 
it's not just about how the laws are made, but the morals behind the laws, which you're expected and you, you're pressured and your kids are being pressured uh, and being taught that this is normal, this is universal, this is how it is, and this is how humans should be. The moral implications that good and bad is decided purely based on respecting everyone's self-ownership, right? And you might think, well, I mean, sure, like if this means that we don't go and kill people or we don't go and th thieve from people, even though well, thieving is technically not, uh, um, not their body's property but, or the property outside of the body, but uh, surely then we agree with that. Well, yes, we agree that you can't commit murder and you can't thieve, of course, and, and rape and all this stuff. You can't do any of those things, of course, but we have a different basis for why that is wrong. Their basis is that you are transgressing the individual's ownership of, of, over themselves. Uh, and you might say, Abdullah, isn't this not splitting hairs, perhaps? No. Do you know why? Because on that basis, they'll turn around to you and they say, why does your God say that same-sex marriage is wrong or same-sex intercourse is wrong when two consenting adults who both own themselves consent to engage in that with each other? What's wrong with that then? And then they'll turn around to Quran, the Quran and the Bible, and the Tanakh, the Jewish um, Bible, and they'll turn around to all these and say, yeah, these are all unjust. These are all unfair. Because why can't individuals who own themselves decide what to do with their own property? Right? That's how it, they argue it. Of course, our response is, do you own yourself, really? Did you make yourself? Did you create yourself? In some ancient cultures, they used to believe that the parents owned the child because the parent, they would say that the parents made the child, so the child belongs to the parent, even to adulthood still. Own, it was the property of the parents in ancient cultures. Um, I would say that we don't believe that, but they, at least they have some basis to say that. They have some argument, right? It's not our perspective, right? We say, who made everything in this universe? Who made everything in this universe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, we say, um, I'll, I'll tell you why certain types of, not just same-sex intercourse, but intercourse outside of marriage, you know, or, or extramarital intercourse is, is also wrong. I'll tell you why. Um, because you don't have the permission, the consent of the owner of the body. Right. Who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our basis. He owns everything. And he doesn't just make humans and then, and then humans are now self-sufficient and now he just, just watches them and tells them what to do now. No, no, no. He's still sustaining us every, um, every plank unit of time, if not, and smaller, smallest moment, right? or, or maybe not even as the smallest. He's sustaining our existence. So not only does he own us, but he, without him sustaining us, we couldn't sustain ourselves. So not only are, does he have the rights over us because he created us, but that right is, um, is constantly reinforced by the fact that he's sustaining us. Right. So that's how we would argue back. We don't accept the liberal premise. Don't accept the liberal premise or basis. Many Muslims try to argue back accepting the liberal premise, and it ends up with um, when they try, they try to say, oh, Islam is liberal. Oh, did you know that, that the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 1400 years ago, gave rights to women? Well, yes, but not because of individualism, right? not because of liberalism, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala decreed that all insan will have rights and duties upon each other, over each other. That's why. Right? So the, the liberal will argue that all morality that doesn't respect individualism is wrong. And if you don't engage that, if you don't nip it in the bud, that will be a thorn against um, our belief. And your children will be told this idea, they'll accept it, the idea of you know, as long as it's cons consensual, everything's okay. And then they will open up the Quran and they will be um, horrified because they are looking at it through a liberal lens and not through a true lens. And of course, there's political in, um, implications. They argue that all political systems that do not base themselves on individualism are extremist. Right? I tell Muslims, don't use the word extremist. Right? Because when liberal says extremist, they mean that 
It's okay to have religion if you're just praying in your masjid. But if you're saying that God has something to say outside the masjid, this is going over the had, the liberal had, the liberal boundaries. And they say, it's extreme. So when Muslims use that word against each other, you don't know that you're reinforcing what the liberals are saying. The liberals are saying, yes, yes, great. Yes, call each other extreme. You're all extreme. <laughs> right? Yeah? Like, demonstrate you're not extreme by giving the bayah to liberal aqidah. Right? By, by testifying that there's, there's no ilah except the individual. Right? That's, that's their, um, that's their, that's their aqidah, that's their uh, tawheed. Theological implications. You think, okay, Abdullah, liberalism is a political ideology, right? What's, what do you mean by theological implications of um, liberalism? Well, you've heard the term secular liberalism, right? Have you ever wondered why it had the word secular in front of it? Like, why not just call it liberalism? Why do you have to add secular liberalism? Well, that's because uh, liberalism, secular liberalism, has a, li has, a, has a twin brother called religious liberalism. Religious liberalism is simply applying the same doctrine into theology. So they would argue that, a, relig a religious liberal will argue that Jahannam, hell, is unjust unless it's only for those who commit murder and commit rape because that is haram according to liberalism, so they can understand that. But even then they'll say, oh, but it can't be forever because that's more punishment than, the, than it took to make the crime according to liberal standards. So they'll say, it's limited, you know, hell will be for a limited time, and it's only for those who commit murder. They'll say only for bad people. What they mean by that is just people who commit murder and rape and, um, you know, killing and so on and so forth. But they'll say, but someone going Jahannam for committing shirk, which is the worst crime from the Islamic perspective, right? They'll say that's unjust. They're an individual. If they're not hurting anybody, why is Allah punishing them? In fact, taking this logic um, to its, its kind of natural conclusion, they'll say that actually, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even give us commands? Aren't we individuals? Don't you own yourself? So why is he interfering like an interloper? This is how they argue it. They view him as an interloper who's interfering in your lives because according to them, you own yourself. So if you own yourself, who is someone else to tell you what to do? That's the logic, and then they become atheists. And when you hear people who are ex-Muslim, they use the argument. They say, why is this? They, they use the word tyrant, they use the word nasty words against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of their ignorance or out of their, their um, insincerity and kufr. And they say that, oh, he's a tyrant over us because why is he telling us what to do? Why does he care what we're doing? So we're not bothering him. Again, liberal um, assumption that in liberalism, you don't bother your neighbor unless your neighbor's bothering you. So they say, if how I want to pray or who I want to pray to, if I don't even want to pray at all, why does that bother the creator? Why is he going to punish me for that? That is because the Aqidah of liberalism makes them think that way. So if you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. But more, but more likely, it will deal with your kids. And you'll see them escape your grasp like sand coming out your fingers because you thought well you know islam is uh, is, is is the haq so it, it should like sell itself yeah well you know you go put the quran on a chair this is um, imam ali's test to the khawarij you go put a quran on the chair and let it rule you get you you put the quran on the chair and let the, the quran give da'wah no it needs you to read it to people in fact the quran actually became uh, started out not as a book, a physical book that was bound together in leather, right? Started out as what was recited. Yeah. So just because we're upon the huck doesn't mean that people are going to realize that or notice it. It relies on you to explain that. Now, for those who, who don't know what feminism is, feminism, where, how it started out was simply that in the West, when they, let's say, came up with liberalism, they gave, uh, they gave these, these rights, uh, uh, these protected rights against tyrannical government to, to individuals, but only to, to men, individual men. Ironically spe speaking, many of the Anglo-Saxon liberals, they viewed themselves as empiricists, as scientists, 
and they, they made the very unscientific assumption that because they weren't educating women, and of course women then weren't being educated and therefore were not um, accomplished um, you know, middle class uh, composers, playwrights, mathematicians, or what have you, astronomers, oh, then women are of an inter inferior intellectual status to men, and that's just the natural way, they say, they said, because, well, they didn't teach them in the first place, you know, they didn't give them that education in the first place. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they called that scientific observation <laughs> by saying, well, yes, um, then women must be inter inferior because uh, clearly they're not achieving the same as men. Well, yeah, you, but that's because you're not educating them. So based on that basis, they said, well, then, um, then men have the fullest intellectual faculties, and therefore men should get the full gamut of, of um, liberal rights promised. Feminism was simply the argument that, and women too, hashtag me too, right? right? Include us too in those rights, yeah? Now, um, Simone de Beauvoir and others, some people say that they argued uh, that these various feminists argued that, that um, men and women share a mind, uh, we have mind and therefore a mind does not have a gender. But that wasn't invented, that term wasn't invented by a woman, it actually was invented by a guy in uh, the 17th century, Francois Poulain de la Barre. He said the mind has no sex. And he first argued for the absolute equality behind, between men and women, but the absolute identical roles for men and women, because he simply argued that the mind transcends the body. And so the mind is like free from any animalistic um, aspects of the human body that we might share with animals. And so uh, in, in this kind of realm where the mind is somehow detached from the body, all minds are equal. Right? That was the argument. That's how, and that's, that's from continental philosophy. I'm not going to get into the difference between Anglo-Saxon philosophy and continental philosophy, but suffice to say, this followed a, Euro, a continental European tradition, and um, England followed Anglo-Saxon kind of tradition of being more empiricist, even though they made unempirical arguments, but that's a long story, long discussion. Um, so the first wave of, you could say, feminism was um, liberal feminism, that women should have identical rights to men, because in the West, women couldn't own property, and when they were married, their property that they, they came with went to their husbands, they couldn't open up a bank account without their husbands. Their husbands controlled all their finances, right, which was rather oppressive. And you know, when they come to us and they say, you know, we have uh, rights for women. We, you know, you should learn from us. And say, wait, 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 wait a second. Your backward past is, is that's your past. Yeah, D don't project it onto us. We didn't have that circumstance and situation with ourselves. Um, but over time, there was some development, developments in, West, in the West, not just um, for women, but also for the working class, because the working class were not given the right to vote. Uh, only those who had property had the right to vote. Um, there's a re there was an early the early form of liberalism only gave it to probably people that had property. Uh, but eventually it got extended out, and of course, then the idea that the government should do more than just protect you from the violence of each other, but the government should give you welfare, became the next evolution of liberalism and it was called social liberalism, because the first form of liberalism led to so much um, suffering and exploitation, workers being exploited. If you get maimed in the factory, you're done. No one's going to employ you. No one's going to give you money. Right? Uh, if you can starve to death in London, on the streets of London, even though it was a, a bustling town, because if you were poor, no, you know, unless you go to an alms house, which is uh, usually by, run by the, 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 a, a Christian foundation, giving alms to the poor, you're going to die. No one's going give to you, give you food. The government don't care about you getting, getting food and what have you, right? So they noticed that this was, you know, like Charles Dickens talked about these kind of things quite a lot, became quite popular. And so they decided to, they needed to um, change the first form of liberalism because it was too much concentration of wealth. If you think, was it 50% or 60% of the, of the um, wealth is owned by 1%? You think that's bad today? In the 1900s, it was 80% of the wealth was owned by 1%. Back then, it was really crazy. They had to bring, invent antitrust laws. These were things that were invented. They're technically against liberalism. Technically, liberalism actually failed in the 19th century. They, what you're seeing today is the, is the patch 2.0. They just patched it. Right? And there are many people which actually say that it's not actually liberal anymore. But you, you know them as conservatives now. Conservatives are just old liberals. <laughs> liberals from the, the old version of it. Old version of the matrix. <laughs> right. 
So social liberals said, you know what, women should have not just equal rights, but they should have equal opportunities to men, and therefore um, we must make sure that workplaces um, hire uh, women as well as men, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And then you had an, another stream of left-wing thinking, which has always been, it's been like the, I was going to call it the, the dark side, you know, like the, the Enlightenment produced the liberalism, then it, it had a dark side to it, but technically speaking, it's all dark side. So there's dark side and a darker side, <laughs> which was um, the kind of Marxist and socialist thoughts, which were always at odds with its cousin, liberalism. And many Muslims become socialist, or some Marxists, though not today after the Soviet Union, but they join these movements which are from Marxist origins, or, or at least socialist origins, because they think the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So. When they discover that there are Western scholars also criticizing liberalism, they think, oh, excellent, I'll, I'll just ally with them. Or, you know, cr the critique of capitalism is popular in the West, but capitalism is just the economic system of liberalism. How is that if liberalism is the hegemonic ideology of the world? Well, that's because there's ikhtilaf in the West. There's different madhahib. But the creeds of all these different madhahib are all the same. Whether you're a socialist or a, Mar or a Marxist, which is a type of socialist, uh, whether you're a liberal, or whether you're a, a woke activist or a post-Marxist, they all believe in the same aqidah of the, in the up absolute sovereignty of the individual. They all follow that same aqidah. You know, just like you can be, it's like, it's like someone saying, go, oh, you know, um, uh, Islam is different from follow, following Abu, Abu Hanifa's um, madhab. Well, no, it, it's a madhab of Islam. The aqidah is from the same as any other of the, of the aqidah or in the different schools of thought. The, the core, the core Akil, that is. Um, so all these different socialists, Marxists, liberals, they all have the same core, core Akida. They just have ikhtilaf about how you achieve this Akida. That's it. So don't get confused by it, just because they, get, they are criticizing um, uh, capitalism or what have you. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we hate capitalism too. Well, like, hold your horses. Make an Islamic critique of capitalism. Don't use a socialist critique of capitalism, right? Uh, and don't use a Marxist critique of capitalism, certainly not. Um, what are the political implications of feminism? Well, is, very simply is this. Just even looking at the approach, they say, look, we're just talking about women's rights. What's wrong with talking about women's, women's rights? Well, we all believe in rights for all insan, and we believe that women, as much as men, have rights in Islam, defined by Islam. Yeah. However, if you're looking at rights in a situation where in, in marriages where there's a husband and a wife and they're relating to each other or, or, uh, or a daughter and a father or whatever conditions that you're, finding, you're discussing is in, it's not just one person in, in these relationships, it's two people in these relationships. And if you don't talk about balancing out the mutual symbiotic relationship between any of these relationships, you're not going to get justice if you just talk about only one side. Now, Yes, there is a problem of domestic abuse. There is a problem of um, women being, um, being divorced and thrown out of the house and not being looked after in many parts of the world, non-Muslims and Muslims. Um, there's the problems which are shown through statistics. No one's disputing them. No one's arguing them. No one's saying, no, 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 women don't face any suffering or any challenges at all whatsoever. No one's saying that. The, the difference of opinion is how to solve those problems. That's the difference of opinion. We agree the problems are there. How do you solve them? And sometimes they use the counter argument saying that, oh, you just hate women, or you're a misogynist, or what have you, just to say. And it's, it's like a, a communist or a Marxist, let's say, coming to you, and they say, look, the, look how poor people are suffering. It's like, yes, yes, we agree, there are poor people who are suffering, homeless people on the street. So, okay, well, then we need to establish Marxism, a Marxist state, uh, which will solve their, these problems. No, 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 we don't want a Marxism state. An Islamic system would also would, 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 uh, address it, but address it better, because your Marxism would throw out the baby with the bathwater, because there are aspects of private property that you need to own. You need to own. It's good for an, an economy. Profit incentive is very useful, even in industries. You need to retain that. But uh, Islam is, for want of a better way to describe it, somewhere between capitalism and, and Marxism. But anyway, and, and then imagine a the Marxist said, oh, you just hate poor people. You don't want to follow Marxism because you hate poor people. So, no, 
I don't hate poor people. I acknowledge the same problem you're acknowledging. I just don't believe in your solution. I think it's going to make it worse. Yeah. So that is our resp that's simply our response. Yeah. And we should, in tandem, do this along with a da'wah in the Muslim world and to Muslims, because we're not here to simply just deflect criticisms. We're here to give solutions. And if you're not giving a solution from Islam, people are going to find it elsewhere. If you're not implementing the Islamic solutions, they're going to go elsewhere. Many um, parents, um, when I was growing up, uh, many parents, they, they were very worried about their children joining peaceful but political Islamic activism. Like, oh, no, you're going to get in trouble. or like, no, Just focus on your career, focus on this, 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 this. And now, then their kids, their ki children want to change the world. They, they, uh, they're not encumbered with the kind of uh, prejudices and biases that we later on accrue um, through getting, getting them comfortable <laughs> in the society. So they want to change the world. So if you don't let them want to change the world with the deen of Islam, they'll find another deen that will welcome them with open arms. Right. And, they'll, and it gives them, give them meaning. They think, oh, I'm doing something meaningful. Because, uh, and they'll follow this deen or the deen because you're not letting them follow the deen of Islam and implement it. And of course, there's other implications of feminism. It creates asabiyya, but in this case, gender asabiyya. It's a fight between women and men. Uh, and I've seen, I've seen um, how people actually um, argue it. I saw one, it was, it was meant to be a sense to be a Muslim sister, and she, had a, she was um, like, m making some invectives against me. And on her profile, she said, my gender is my nation. Like, uh, I don't think, I don't think um, there are many women around the world that really don't care about you because you're not part of their nation. They don't see you as part of their nation just because you share the same chromosomes and, and, uh, and, and um, other aspects. So if, if feminism is adopted, um, the implications are that Islam itself will be viewed as um, a, the dom uh, in, enshrining the domination of men. Even though there's aspects of Islam which require men to give to women their, their wages, their, they work for women, they support women, they, they protect women, defend women, they, um, feminists won't, don't care about that. What they care about is when they see aspects of Islam that says that the woman has to, in a marriage, she has to, she has rights that she has, um, uh, so her husband has rights upon her. Oh, that's oppressive. No individual should be beholden to any other individual. You see? That's, it's liberal, it's a liberal basis. It's still a liberal basis. It's always a liberal basis. They view that as oppressive. When in Islam, the simple fact of the matter is that the man has things which the woman, um, he, he has to, he's beholden to the woman over, and the woman has, has, has rights which the, the man is beholden to her over. Oh. And the, there's no, even though there is obviously this choice, but it, there, it's obligation. There is obligation. But they can choose to be not practicing Muslims, I suppose, but Islam obliges it. No. There's mutual responsibility there. And if you don't have mutual responsibility, then um, you, don't, you don't have anything in a marriage. How are you going to have a marriage then? There are times when, you, when you're married that you're not, you're not in the best of moods, right? And people say, oh, only do things in a marriage when you feel like it. Well, I say, all right then, well, your husband might be a complete slob and not really care about it because he doesn't, like, <laughs> doesn't feel like caring by his wife today and vice versa. Is that the basis behind which we um, should act as human beings? Just do things only if you feel like it? Or how does that make us different from animals, basically, right? So um, feminism isn't going to bring any um, liberation. It's only going to cause more conflict. And it's going to open up a new front from conflict now. It's going to open up a front of gender asabiya and fighting and rancor between the two. And unfortunately, now what I've seen is that as there are some sisters and, bro and male ally brothers who are um, being feminist and are caught and are touting it online and touting it in their, in their universities and wherever social spaces they go to, there's now um, brothers who are joining Western kind of conservative kind of mindset movements and there's a, like a, a, a proxy fight between Muslims in these two different Western madhabs, <laughs> got nothing to do with Islam, fighting each other 
on, that's, on, on uh, two bases that have nothing to do with Islam, it's, it's really surreal and tragic, actually.